And then, so we got five, five of you here. So the question would be is, what do you guys want to go over? Um, since no one was here on Monday, then Mia was in here. Um, we just talked about her essay, so we can talk about the Tokugawa with the Meiji's um, and that shift in Japan there. We can talk about the opium trade and the opium wars. Uh, we could skip the Friday stuff and do Tanzmat, or if there's other things that you're having questions on based on what you've read, uh, we can go into that stuff there as well. Um, your guys' choice, this is your guys' session. I'm just here to help with any questions you guys have. What was the, um, there was the samurai class and then there was the other group that went with them. It started with a D, like the Dio or something. The daimyo? Yeah, what are they? They're like lords. So think of it, if we went to, uh, here, I'll bring up an image. So uh, if we think of it just like the Middle Ages in Europe, where you've got the, the kings and you've got the lords and you got different levels of lords in there. And then you have, um, and then you have um, the, the samurai or the knights uh, and knights would be in Europe, samurai are here. And then you got the, the peasants. Now above the peasants, you would have these skilled laborers, merchants and stuff like that in Europe. Uh, but because Japan goes based off of the Confucian ideals, um, merchants get put towards the bottom of things and peasants um, and more skilled laborers are above those guys. So this is what you're talking about. When you see the daimyo, there are these guys um, here a second from the top, which the shogun would be the top daimyo out of that and really is the real ruler during the Tokugawa era. Um, but essentially they're just like local lords. So you got Japan being divided up into several different kingdoms within it with the emperor looking over all of them in name and the Shogun really controlling them because he controls the whole military. Uh, and then that'll change after the Meiji restoration and you'll get rid of Daimyo. Um, uh, some of them will actually help lead the change to the Meiji restoration, but then, um, then the Daimyo will be pretty much phased out as the restoration goes on. They also talked about allowing a 15 year old boy to be like the emperor. So, how did that like they they just discussed it but they didn't say how he did with it did he have like an a lasting impact in any way or did he do something really stupid or like they just say that he was an emperor but they don't say anything else after that you're, you're talking about the emperor meiji then right yeah yeah so he's so he gets used as the conduit to reform japan so you have uh, they were actually going to do it under his father, but then his father dies early, so then they move it up under him. Um, and he's, uh, as he grows older, he takes more of a lead in that. Uh, but really, it's the, oh, they bring it up in the article. I can't remember the specific daimyo, and you're not going to be asked, like, the specific daimyo in any case. Um, but let me try to bring it up here if I bring up the end of the Tokugawa. Um, the it's it's two southern daimyo um or multiple southern daimyo in the boshian war i don't know if it's going to give me them uh none of this one so then that's going to be in the meiji one but um they stand up to to actually give him the power and so um Mutsu, uh suhito who becomes the meiji emperor will will take a lead in how the government runs itself um, and initially, um, will be kind of a stronger leader. Eventually this role will become more of, uh, the emperor will, will not, how do I want to explain it? It's not going to become the same as it was under the Tokugawa era in that they're just a figurehead. Uh, they do have some say in things, but eventually as time progresses and we get to the start of world war II, the emperor really doesn't have as much say as the uh, political body that's actually running things and and the military really starts to run the, that political body and leads to the uh, actions that we'll see of them going in and invading China and invading um, different colonies controlled by Europeans with some of those being ours as well um, and starting off the war in the Pacific with that stuff but um, 
Oh, those daimyo are the Satsuma and Choshu, uh, which are down south. And there's more than that, but it's it's southern Japan that starts revolting, and northern Japan will hold on to the shogunate, but eventually be kind of thrown out once the majority of Japan is under their their influence. So he has a say, but it's not a significant um, say, especially early on when you've got a 15 year old running things, you're not going to give them a ton of power, especially when you're the first to do that. But he eventually does get to have a decent amount of say, although he's, it, it's more the daimyo around him that control things just as we see under the shogunate. Other questions about, we can stick on this Meiji restoration um, tact. Other questions on it from what you guys are seeing. Again, you can turn on your microphone or type through the chat. The Ottomans were at like the same general time. It was talking about the Turks and the Turkic nationalism. Are most of the people in the Ottoman Empire Turkish or were those just like a handful of people that wanted Turk itself to be like the leading rule group or something? Yeah, so the Ottoman Empire is based out of Turkey, and they are they were founded by the Turks. Um, and so if we look at a map, let's go with one that shows, does it show the receding of it? No, that shows the growth. Um, the majority of the empire is Turkish. Uh, so this is the empire in, in 18 or 1900. Uh, so this will be right at the end of our time period. Uh, and you can see that they're, they've got these provinces, all these provinces here. This is all in Russian, so that's great. Um, I can't tell you what any of the provinces are, but they're starting to lose territory. Uh, they've lost Greece when we get to 1900. They've lost the Balkans. Um, and they really lost most, uh, most of North Africa. I think this is kind of showing that they still have North Africa um, with Libya and Egypt, but Libya is taken over by the Italians eventually, and uh, Egypt is controlled initially by France and then by the British. And so the Ottoman Empire by the end is mainly just this, um, where you see Turkey here. You guys probably can't see my cursor on things uh, with this, but it's mainly Turkey um, and then the Middle East. So the Turks are the majority population, um, and you have that Young Turks movement that. Uh, I'll probably talk a little bit more about this on Friday with things, but we can just actually take general questions on Friday as well. Uh, but um, you have them pushing back in uh, that they want the Ottoman Empire to become more Turkic uh, than uh, the other uh, ethnicities that are there. Like you have the, uh, if we went into, again, you guys can't see, wait, actually I can do stuff. I can annotate things. So let's, let's test things. Um, so I think you guys can probably see this right here. If we're talking about this region, this ethnic group over here is more like the, the Kurds. Um, and so they're separate from the Turks. The Turks are going to be mainly here in this region. Um, you've got the Balkans here, which are European. Some are going to be um, Serbs. Uh, primarily, but you got Croats, you got a bunch of different groups over here. In here, you're going to have more of the Arab influence um, of people as well as in Egypt is mostly Arab uh, from um, the, the spread of the Bedouins out and in, into these regions. So you've got that. And then over here on the far side here, what you have the, you have the Iranians um, or the Persians. So um, the Safavid Empire has fallen by this point, though, in 1900. But that's what you kind of have going on. So you have this idea in Turkey, the young Turks wanting to nationalize it and make Turkey a, a Turkic state for the Turks. And really, who cares about those other ethnic groups? Um, 
which will lead to what we'll see in at the end of World War I called the, uh, the Armenian Genocide. We'll see that, unfortunately, happen. Um, where also in this region that I've circled, you have Armenia. Uh, and so, um, yeah. Hopefully, can you see, you guys can see all those highlightings. Oh, and you guys can't see my cursor, excellent. So I'll erase all those things. What other questions do we have on, on things? Anything else about the Ottomans? So then I guess my question would be, did the Ottomans end up um, having the Turks take over then, or did the Europeans take over? So uh, World War I will happen. The Ottomans will choose the wrong side of the war to be on, and their empire will be broken up by the French and the British. And so you'll have, um, let's go to this. Uh, We'll see if this brings up the map here of it. Hopefully it brings up the Ottoman Empire. Oh, that's an ugly looking map. There, so in this, I didn't want to bring it up that way though. So in this map you'll see, and this is smaller. I'll try to make it a little bit bigger. Um, but Turkey will be established as its own state there, uh, which is the modern day Turkey. Um, then the rest of the regions will be divided up into different kingdoms for the Europeans to control and get divided by, again, the British and the French um, down, down here. And so you can see all the different, all the different regions there uh, that pop up. Um, so you get Palestine, Syria, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Jordan. Um, all these are divided to make things easier for them to, to run. As well as you'll have all these regions freed with Yugoslavia uniting most of those uh, Balkan groups. Um, and also taking over some of the territory from Austria-Hungary. But that's getting into stuff next. You know, but that's what happens with it. So it gets divided up by the Europeans, the British and the French primarily. And uh, you get Turkey becoming Turkey. Um, and then you get the other regions being colonies of theirs. And then after World War II, we'll see that they become independent states. And you'll see the borders are about the, uh, the same. Syria will be divided up a little bit more. And that you'll get Lebanon right about there. Um, where else? At the bottom of Iraq, you'll see Kuwait be established somewhere right about there. Um, and then in Saudi Arabia, you'll see some other kingdoms pop up, like the United Arab Emirates and, and that stuff um, be established there with no long-term impacts at all to stability in the region because they divided it all up perfectly based on ethnic groups and stuff like that. And if you couldn't follow the sarcasm there, it's, uh, it's, that's not what happens. It's still a mess here today, as you guys can see, uh, with things. And a lot of it stems from um, how we see this get divided up. So. So that's basically what will happen to the Ottoman Empire uh, when they fail to, um, to industrialize and to catch up with the Europeans. I know I'm kind of jumping around, but um, in the book with Japan, it was talking about um, them accepting the Europeans kind of like how China did with unfair treaties and whatnot because the British wanted to get in. I mean, not the British, America wanted to get in and trade with them. And that was that Perry guy. Yep, Commodore Perry. Why did they, uh, <clears throat> why did they ever like reopen trade and accept to work with them again if they were doing fine without anyone else before? Um, good question. Uh, they weren't doing fine. And that brings us to actually one of our, Oh, I didn't want to do that. Let me do this. That actually brings us to one of the discussion questions, I think. 
or if it's not, it's something that we should talk about because it links these two things in here from uh, Monday, which I had up there, and, and what we have here uh, today for Wednesday. Um, it, it, it links these two. So let's, instead of me talking the whole time, I'm sure though my nice, soothing, monotone voice is helpful uh, with things, but anyone else have an idea how the opium war connects to? Uh, if you've looked at this stuff, how the opium war connects to Japan opening their borders. Um, I mean, the, the the one answer I'll say, the, the simplest answer is Commodore Perry comes, comes with big guns, like cannons and stuff like that, that the Japanese don't have. So they're partially signed or forced to sign the treaty because of um, the a guns put to their head, like you either need to let us in or we're going to conquer you and make you a colony. So that was the one thing, but the, there was a, the, the opium wars connect this a little bit more. Anyone else have an idea how the opium wars would show Japan that they want to do something different? Come on, folks, just type on in here, please. Okay, we practiced the wait time that teachers are supposed to do at least 10 seconds. Um, can anyone tell me what happened in the, or can anyone tell us what happened in the Opium Wars? Does anyone know? I remember reading that it was something with like the, the British, um, Japan, emperor had like banned the use of opium again because he didn't like that everyone was addicted so the british as like in an almost like spiteful way in revenge for them blocking off british imports like fought them in the opium war out of spite yeah um you want to talk about china there with that though so this all happens in china um, and as Kendall said in the chat, the, the, they get addicted to opium from the Europeans and it's actually just one European group in particular here. And that's going to be Britain because Britain controls, um, well, anyone know what, where most of the opium came from or poppies today? Uh, it's still actually the same region in the world. If you know where India Yes, India and Afghanistan is primarily regions, which is also why there's still issues in Afghanistan because uh, that's their major crop that they can grow for, for cash. Um, and then you send it to pharmaceutical companies. But um, with, the, with the opium, it becomes the one profitable thing that the British can send to China um, because uh, with the silver drain, they're just losing money day after day after day after what they send into China to get the, the silk and teas and everything else, especially... Uh, with Britain because they get so addicted to tea. You've got tea time that you got to have. And so uh, with them being so addicted to it, uh, they need to find something. And they find out that there's um, there's a desire for opium there. Uh, it's not used super heavily at the time, but it's used by a small group of people the, in China. And uh, they find ways to smuggle it in. Now, um, it was supposed to be just taken over the... So if we go, I wonder if there's an opium wars map that I can bring in. I'm sure there is. So if we go, those are all pictures. So if we go to a map. This will do. So if we look at this map here, um, you've got the opium in India and... Uh, and, and it's the whole colony of India, which controls parts of Afghanistan, parts of Pakistan today, Bangladesh, all these regions. And what they do is what they're um, taking is they're having smugglers come across the border and bring it into China. That is a terrible arrow. We're not going to, we're not going to try it. We're just going to keep withdrawing straight lines or crooked lines here. 
Um, so they bring it here. But eventually what happens is they start uh, not wanting to make it so dangerous to bring in by going over there, especially since it's getting confiscated. And so they start just bringing it into the port of Canton here, uh, which is, uh, if you didn't know, I'm going to try to write with this. Uh, this will become Hong Kong. Hey, it kind of works. I'm not as good as, uh, uh, what is it? Nope, that's, that's bad. We're, we're just going to stop drawing it. Um, so it, it gets dropped into, or they start selling it at, at Hong Kong. Now, Hong Kong is just an island off of um, the, the main shore of Canton because uh, foreigners cannot go into China because of their isolationism. And what happens is eventually uh, the, the opium that's getting pushed in or smuggled in there gets confiscated by the Chinese. Uh, the Chinese official down there burns it all and it's millions of dollars worth. And the, the British merchants are super upset about how much money they lost. And the Chinese are like, it, it was illegal. And you wouldn't let us bring illegal goods into your country. So why is it acceptable for you to do it here? Um, that doesn't really matter to the British merchants. They don't care about that argument. Uh, and they just want to get their money back. So they're the, the diplomat to the region uh, for Britain says, okay, we're going to try to work out an agreement. They try to work out an agreement. Um, it doesn't happen. Then tensions flare and two British sailors go and kill um, a Chinese man or a few Chinese people uh, in that region. They want to put them on trial. The British go, no, we're going to put them on trial ourselves. And China goes, no, you can't do that. And that leads to then fighting um, or the, the British get put, pushed out. And eventually you'll get fighting happening. And um, the, the British, because they have a modernized Navy um, and have uh, much better weapons and everything else than the Chinese, uh, they, they will just steamroll them um, and win every battle pretty handily. And then what will happen is um, they'll win in this region of Hong Kong uh, or in Canton, and then uh, they'll start pushing up. Uh, because they they came to a tentative treaty and then both sides rejected it saying it's not enough in our favor and um, so they push up to Shanghai which is over here uh, and uh, they start going through the the Yangtze River and once they control the the cities here that then go up the um, the Grand Canal which will go up to Beijing here roughly in this region it's probably a little bit not right there but close enough um, they pretty much have a straight shot to Beijing and to the emperor's palace. And so China relents and gives, uh, the, the deal gets so much worse for the Chinese, even though they think they can win. Um, the emperor is not very knowledgeable on the situation. doesn't know how bad it's going. Uh, the officials that are talking to him are telling him that it's, uh, that the Chinese situation is much better than it actually is. And so he gets kind of hosed here uh, with what happens, but that's, that's part of the corruption that we see at the end of a, uh, a dynastic cycle and that you have incompetent people in control and doing things. And that leads to then the Ming or the Qing's eventual downfall in 1911. But um, you have this, this first war happen and everyone goes <coughs> um, after they see the terms that Britain gets and that they get Hong Kong essentially indefinitely or what seems like indefinitely. Uh, and by the second one, they'll get a 99, they'll, they'll make it kind of permanent that they have Hong Kong indefinitely because they'll get a 99 year lease on it, uh, which is why Hong Kong just recently in the last uh, 10 years, was it 98 or so? Um, uh, in 98 or so when Hong Kong um, was returned to China. Um, and now it's an autonomous zone. That's a whole different thing. But um you have this happen and all the other Europeans go, Oh, China's open for business now. And China really wasn't. Uh, but then the Europeans, especially the British find a new excuse to go and attack China, especially because the emperor starts pushing back against this treaty. That's really unfair. And, uh, what happens is the British win handily, the French jump in, they win handily. And so everyone gets a different sphere of influence. So Britain gets Hong Kong and, and Shanghai, uh, those areas, uh, other Europeans will get different areas. That's when we saw that um, that that uh, cartoon image of the the pizza pie and whatnot. Um, so let's bring that up again. 
Um, so we've got this. This is the one I'm talking about here that we looked at and analyzed. Uh, but you can see other ones are this, like you got the, the Chinese dragons dead. So you got Russia looking to get in and all these animals show different kingdoms. Uh, this would be Britain here, the lion. Um, but you got everyone looking at it. And the Americans are also, you can see in the back left, the Americans are looking to get in on this as well, but uh, we're not able to get in. And we don't feel like going to war with China for this. Uh, so that's why then we focus on Japan. And us focusing on Japan then uh, leads us up. Oh, Curtis said 97 was when Hong Kong came in. Sorry, that's a ADD type thing of me jumping in and jumping to that. But, um, but uh, we see... Um, the U.S. tried to jump in, and that's why we then jumped to Japan, going like, well, we need to get a foothold here somewhere, so we send Commodore Perry over there. Um, and the Japanese go, okay, so we just saw what happened to our stronger neighbor, the Chinese, and they're getting carved up by the Europeans, and we want to make sure that doesn't happen, and so therefore we're going to modernize. And so they quickly industrialized by bringing the Europeans in on their own terms. And yes, there are slightly unfair treaties, and this has been a long way to get to this, but um, to finally get to answer your question here, Mia, is they, they bring them in in partially unfair treaters so that then they can get everything they can from them. So they're going to get the industrialization techniques, um, the factories, how you do all that stuff. They're going to learn this from the Europeans. Uh, they're going to learn the new modern style of fighting from the Europeans. Um, let's see if I can bring up a... Actually, we'll just do this. Um, I have it up here. So uh, we can see some comparisons here and how things look. Um, uh, I was going to have us analyze these. We don't really have the time for this. Uh, the meeting will probably be saying or giving me a message here that, hey, we got to wrap things up here in about five minutes or so because uh, we only get 30 minutes. But um, you can see here, here's a modern factory for silk uh, being used. That's going to allow them to make a lot more uh, silk products. Um, you can see they bring in the, the steamboat, uh, which is going to allow them to navigate the rivers, but also just travel across the world a lot faster. Um, you can see new buildings. Uh, you can also see these wires coming off the buildings. What do you think those wires are coming off the buildings and coming into this post office? Would be anyone chat-wise? Yeah, that's a telegraph there. So those are telegraph lines coming in here in the, in the early or in the mid to late 1800s. Um, see that going in. So by doing all this, they're then going to be able to modernize and fend off any European um, attacks against them. And so none of the Europeans try to mess with them because they'll modernize their military as well. Uh, for their land-based army, you want to guess who they base theirs off of? What European power they'd want to use? That's the strongest land empire or the strongest land army. Oh, come on. Someone's got to have a guess. Britain's a good guess. Uh, they'll use Britain, but not in the land part of the military. They'll use them for their Navy. Uh, Britain's got the, the top Navy in the world, and they will be they will continue to have that until after World War. Well, really, yeah, after World War I, going into World War II or so, um, they will lose that spot to then the United States. Um, so Britain's a good guess there, but they're not the strongest um, army. The strongest army in Europe is one on the continental piece of the region. Anyone got another guess? France is another good guess there. Uh, they would be like number two probably in a standing army. But it's going to be, it's the, it's the rising power in Europe that they're going to take after here. Um, that threatens to bring down everything during uh, World War I that everyone's worried about. And that's going to be, anyone got it? Yeah, Germany or Prussia at the time. So they use Prussian army tactics uh, in their army. So they, they cherry pick who's got the best stuff. And that's what those, the same thing they'll do with their, um, with their industrialization. And so we can see here, there's, if you look at their military, very much Western style of dress and everything like that. And if we compare that to what was happening before here, I have to zoom in some, but you can see here, here their, their samurai and their, their daimyo or some type of lord or leader there. 
which is much different than what we see with these soldiers with modernized rifles and um, uniforms and everything else. So um, that's kind of the major restoration. That's why it happens because they can have a, they can still have their sovereignty or control of themselves while yes, giving up some to the Europeans, but eventually they get, um, they get to become equals to them. Although the Europeans will never look at them as equals, which is, really upsetting to them. We'll see that lead to their actions going into World War II because uh, they're not invited to be a major part of the talks in uh, at the end of World War I because they're not European enough for it. Any other questions on things? I'm curious as to when I'm gonna get a message from Zoom about things here that we need to wrap up the meeting or maybe they're just going to be generous again and let us go on ad infinitum. Who knows? Looks like we're going to be able to keep going because I think I started this at 38. Oh, interesting. We've got an indefinite amount of time. Good, good stuff. That'd be nice if they do that all the time. So other questions on things. Uh, we kind of just covered the Meiji Restoration in kind of a lecture format here. Um, I actually really like doing this, uh, going through this artwork and showing this stuff. Uh, it's probably a little bit tougher on your guys' end to or to have like an actual kind of organic conversation about this stuff. But, um, and I might be scrolling too fast for you guys to see everything here, but you guys can see some of the major changes here. Um, in this one, you probably see a little bit less, but you see, uh, what ways do you see, if we look at this Western influence in this, in this image here of the factory that we didn't necessarily have, or that we definitely didn't have here in this one. Uh, but where do you guys see some Western influence? Yep, so those machines are gonna definitely be part of that Western influence there. Um, they're, they're the most obvious thing that are in there, but can anyone see anything else that shows a Western influence coming into Japan and challenging their, their traditional culture? And maybe I'll try to direct the attention a little bit by drawing a little bit. But if you look down, I don't know how well you guys can see that red. Let's choose a different color. Lime green. If you look down here, what do we see in this bottom corner that would show that there's kind of some some Western influence going on there? Okay, let's, let's zoom in a little bit more there then. If I go back to my drawing and we do this, how do we see this guy right here or this guy or this guy showing that they're influenced by the West? What do we see? And it might be easier to chime in on your microphone here than it is to, to type everything. But yeah, the clothing is the big thing there. What's, what's different about the clothing there, Kendall? Yep, so we got the Western hats and suits. That's how we see Western influence coming in here. And that's that's what we're gonna see if we look through this. So let's let's just keep going through this then. So we looked at, okay, let's erase those. If we keep going down to the next one. So now we've got this bridge. This is the Ryogoku Bridge. I don't know exactly where the Ryogoku Bridge is. Um, 
if that's the name of it or if it's in that town or what not uh, but um, if you look at this one now what are some Western influences we see yep with the boats what what kind of boats and I brought this one up we might have brought this one up a little bit already uh, but what what do we see with those boats yep steam powered so we've got the let's let's draw it's fun drawing things so we've got the steam powered boats right here you can still see the traditional influence too because you got the smaller boats and if we went uh, back up we'd see some of those uh, what else do we see Western influence wise Yep, you got clothing again, so we can see some guys here in more of a, a suit. <clears throat> I don't know if we can see any women in chains clothing. Um, I'm trying to scour through it. I can't really tell, but you can see some of the clothing changing. I guess that's that's more of a Western style. That's not the traditional style there. Um, so we can see that changing there. What else? There's still more stuff. Yeah, the architecture. So if we look at the, the building over here, um, you've got a major change in how architecture is being done or what the buildings are designed like. I'm gonna scroll back up here. Those circles are gonna stay there for a second. Um, but you can see that's much different than the traditional Japanese buildings here. Um, much more out of wood and kind of square. So you got the paper windows and whatnot. And when we go back down to here, those windows aren't paper anymore. Those are going to be glass windows. You've got the, the banisters here. This is very much a colonial style of, of building. So you've got that going on. Um, trying to think if there's anything else that would be there. The one last thing I might point out here with this on that would be, I think, this. And I'm going to have to zoom in to try to see if that's what I think it is. I think that's a clock that's right here though. I, I'm presuming that's supposed to be a clock right right here. Um, I don't know why else you would have a circle thing. It could be a window, but uh, being that you're at a tugboat port or something like that, time's usually important just like it is at a railroad. And so I'm gonna just guess that's a clock there, uh, but it might not be, but that would be something else that's again, more modern being brought into this. So um, we see that here at the bridge. Uh, let's zoom out a bit again. Okay, and let's go down to our next one. So now we've got this market. Um, anyone know what famous mountain that is behind uh, in the background of this scene? Let's circle the mountain. Anyone know what mountain that is? Yeah, it's Mount Fuji. It's where Fuji apples come from. So you got Mount Fuji there. And actually, you'll see that a lot in Japanese paintings, uh, especially when they're around uh, Tokyo. Um, and it's not necessarily going to be accurate to where it is, but it's it's going to be there somewhere. So um, you can see here's like kind of a traditional marketplace type thing. Uh, I can't remember. It doesn't really have an ex Oh, it does. Um, uh, but this, I just kind of a street market or just a, a street in general. Um, but you can see how they're carrying things around. You've got uh, more of the traditional way of doing it. You've got the, the guy with the poles with um, two baskets on it. You've got guys carrying things by hand. Um, so we've got those more traditional ways of doing things that you would expect to see in ancient Japan. And then if we go to the new one, uh, we see some changes, but also some, some similarities here. So, um, what are, let's, let's go with, what are some traditional things you guys see here when we look at this? Um, I'm going to try to make my screen bigger here on my end so I can see things clearly, but what, what are some traditional things we see here? Let's, let's do that. We'll circle those in one color. Uh, let's go with, uh, blue should stand out on this. I hope. So what are some traditional things we see in this picture that would be more what we'd see in the Tokugawa era? I don't know if the clothing is like specific, but the umbrellas and the big poofy skirts. 
Um, so that's actually going to be the, the umbrella and the big booby skirt. That's going to be a modern thing. So we'll bring that. But you can see actually some traditional clothing, clothing right here. These might be geishas still right there in the middle. Um, you got the basket carrying by hand. Um, so you got, yeah. I wonder if there's a way that I could have you guys select things on here. That would be, that would be interesting. I don't know how I'd do that. That's something to work on in the future. But yeah, I should have you guys select things. But you can see, so I've selected three things. You got the basket carrying guy, you got the, the basket carrying guy, or carrying things by hand. Uh, anything else there in the chat or that we can bring up? So there is at least one more thing I would bring up, and that would be actually, this guy's probably the best example of this, but you can also see this uh, right here. Uh, what are these, these things here that I've circled? Anyone know what those are? Oh man. Okay. So those are rickshaws and those are hand or human pulled rickshaws. That would be more of an ancient way of going around. Um, I don't know though. I, I don't know if those are, are were heavily used in Japan beforehand. I would presume somewhat, uh, but I really don't know the extent to it, but I know that's, that's more of an older way of traveling. Whereas you can see one of the newer ways of traveling. So I'll kind of kick this off. Let's go with uh, orange. Orange will hopefully stand out. Um, maybe not. Let's see if we can choose a better color. How does white look? If we go with white, that stands out. So you can see these more, these newer chariots or Western designs of chariots and whatnot. That's going to be more of a modern thing. Um, but let's go, let's go into that shift to modern. Uh, one thing we also pointed out early on, you got the telegraph lines coming in here. Uh, you do have clocks again. Where are we seeing the clock in here, though? Oh, right there at the top. Yep, I'm blind. So we got clocks. What else? I think we brought up the, Mia brought up the clothing here, the yellow dress. Uh, with that, that's more of a Victorian area dress. Definitely the the glass and the architecture. And even if we just, I could circle the whole building there, um, this whole post office building is there. We can actually see if we look far enough back, if I go back to my blue, you can see a more traditional building there. And then you can see these newer ones um, in this more colonial style um, throughout the building or throughout the, the painting. Let's see, anything else that we can point out with this that would stand out as modern? Not really. Um, what else do I want to bring up? So what are, let's see, I'm going to point out a few more things. What are these pink trees, though, that we see? Anyone have an idea of what these pink trees are? This is something very important to Japanese culture. Yeah, those are the cherry blossoms. So those are favorite, famous cherry blossom trees. And then what's that there? If we look there, hopefully you guys can see those green circles on it. And that is, yes, Mount Fuji again. Uh, again, when you're, uh, if you're looking at Edo or Tokyo, uh, we're going to see a lot of in, in it, whether it's accurate or not, we're going to see Mount Fuji show up somewhere. Um, it's just part of the culture with, with that. So. Uh, we'll erase all that stuff and let's move down to, um, we can look at that last one again that we were looking at beforehand, uh, with the army here. So 
what are some the modernization things that you can tell uh, from this that are being incorporated into the Japanese army? So again, looking at the modernization from the Meiji Restoration here, what do we see? So you got horses. Horses would have been something that were there as well under the in the Japanese era or in the Tokugawa era, but the outfits or the uniforms definitely. Um, can anyone point out anything in those uniforms that's more of a modern thing or a Western style of thing that would be typical of um, of a European style of military uniform? Yep, those hats are going to be one thing. Uh, so those are definitely more of a European style of hat. What else? Uh, the sash is, yep. Does anyone know what those sashes tell us? Yep, those usually go with ranks. Um, what else? What, what are these things here? Yep, the badges, or the those actually aren't badges right here. Um, they would be actually medals that they've earned. Um, so you got the medals. What about this right here? I, I can't make it narrow enough. I'd like to make it narrow and on an angle, but um, yeah, the sword, what's different about that? If we talk about that in comparison to, let's see, do we see swords here? Uh, I don't think I can zoom in enough to actually be able to see the swords there. But uh, if we saw the swords there, what makes this sword different? Or anyone know what the different styles of swords are there? So this is a more European style of sword. If we looked at the traditional samurai sword, uh, that's going to be called a katana. Um, and so you're going to look at something that's more in this line of, of swords. Um, not meant as much for uh, riding on horseback and stuff like that. And so they shift over. Although the katana will come back, and we'll see it actually be with the officers in World War II. Uh, it will be with them. Oh, let's see if I can bring this to here. Where's my, there it is. Okay, so we'll see that come back in World War II. It'll be with some of their officers. But in this case, they've gone uh, pretty far to make sure that they're not having a Katana style of sword there. Um, if we look at the soldiers, what are some things we see that are more modern. So if we go more to the background, I guess these guys are soldiers, but this is the officer corps up here directing the soldiers. Anyone see any European influence with, with that stuff? Uh, yep, the bugles. So we got the bugles right there and, and not the chips that you uh, make claws with on your hands, but, um, but those guys there, yep, that's gonna bring in, in, in signals. That's more of a European style of thing. What else? Yep, you got guns. Um, in this case, these are going to be rifles. Them being lined up in a line like that is going to be part of their tactics as well. Although if we talk about tactics in the, in the ancient world um, or older, before the modern era or even early modern era, they would have been also in, in lines and formations similar to this. But yes, the fighting style is going to be uh, different in that they're going to go shoulder to shoulder um, and do volleys at each other uh, for the most part early on. Um, What about this though over here? Does anyone know what this is? Yep, it's a flag and it's the Japanese flag, but it's actually not the real Japanese flag. It's actually their military flag. Um, but this gets developed at the time to show them. Anyone know what's a, what it's a symbol of? It is a, yes, it's a symbol of their nationalism, but um, what is on the flag? Anyone know what that is? Yeah, it's the red sun. Anyone know why they base their flag around the, the sun? 
Uh, this is, I believe, is the rising sun. Let's go and just make sure that I'm right. Yep, so that's the rising sun flag. Um, it's the flag associated with their military. And when you want to know why they would choose the sun as their as one of their symbols. So that comes back to then the idea of the emperor. The emperor is viewed as um, it's actually kind of similar to the Incas. The emperor is viewed as similar to the to the sun god. Um, um, not that he is necessarily a god or anything like that, uh, but um, they're viewed as descendants of the the sun, and so um, that is why Japan's sim signal is is that. And Japan today still has an emperor. Um, their current emperor. Actually, they just went through a transition. Uh, the The most recent emperor, you actually had the first um, transition um, or abdication of of power. Uh, it's the first time that uh, power is abdicated in Japan from one emperor to the to the next. And they're saying they won't let that happen again in the future. But um, yeah, it's uh, kind of an interesting thing going on. Is that why during the Meiji Restoration, it was a 15-year-old who was in charge because he was like the origin closest to the sun or something? Yeah, it, it all relates to that family. So the family is descended from that idea. And uh, so they, they keep that in line. And that's why the we'll see this this becomes a major issue in World War II with what we say is going to be the end terms of, of things in World War II um, because uh, we want to see them end their monarchy and they go, no, that's that's not possible for us to do. And so we will uh, bring the war to an end and saying that they need to abdicate and then we'll decide, you know what, we're not gonna force you to do that. And they finally kind of stop fighting after that, also after we drop two nuclear weapons on them. Um, <clears throat> but uh, part of the issue was there. Um, there's, there's major arguments over whether we should have used the nuclear weapons or not. Um, and we won't get into that now, but, but one of the reasons why Japan kept fighting or kept resisting was because we were saying they had to get rid of their emperor and they're like, N no, we can't do that. That's part of our culture. And we're like, N no, you need to get rid of your emperor. And so we're, we're on, we're completely opposed to each other. And, um, you eventually do get to where they actually, where we come to an agreement that, okay, you don't have to get rid of your emperor, uh, but we're going to modify things and make it so that he doesn't have any, a pow any power. Cause we blamed it on him partially on why this whole thing happened because everything went through the emperor, even if it was just his uh, tacit approval. And that's kind of what happens here is the emperor signs off on things um, and also has some direction on where things go. But um, more so here, he actually has more control here than he had in the Tokugawa era, but yeah. Oh, hey, so for the opium war in China, how did that affect their economy since they spent so long trying to get all the silver and then they were giving everything out to pay? Yeah, so their, uh, their economy plummets with opium um, for multiple reasons. One, yes, that silver is now leaving the country. Uh, that's the biggest effect, and that's why they try to stop it. Uh, but also, opium is not a, a good drug. Um, not that any drugs are really good. Uh, but uh, it's a really bad drug when it comes to productivity uh, because it leads you to be very unproductive in that um, you become very lethargic using it. It's a highly addictive substance. And when you have people in the upper courts or in the military and stuff like that, and this was one of the problems with their military is, and why they got beat so handily by the British was because they, um, well, parts of their, their core had become addicted to it and so we're not ready right away and, and we're not in fighting shape and and whatnot so it, it it really destroys the japanese economy and um they're still making all those products that everyone wants so everyone still wants the tea they want the silk they want those things uh but now the tables have been turned in that um the silver is going away from china which makes it very difficult i don't know enough though to say that they end the silver standard and i don't know if if the Qing dynasty kept up the silver standard on things. Um, but 
yeah, it, it, it severely impacts the Chinese economy. It makes it very difficult for them even to try to industrialize. They will half-heartedly try to industrialize, but then they don't want to disrupt the traditional Confucian way of doing things. So that causes problems. And what we'll see happen is actually something known as the Boxer Rebellion, which I didn't bring up on any of the things. Uh, but this is a rebellion against foreigners that happens in Beijing. And Japan will actually send the most troops in here uh, to China. Um, they'll send their army in there to, to squash that rebellion because they want to get a they they want to get in on the action of, with China and be like the Europeans in there. Uh, they've rivaled um, or looked at. Um, well, yeah, they've been a rival to China throughout history and been the the little kind of step sibling or cousin or or whatever, just a small uh, empire in the periphery that China keeps trying to conquer, um, but was never able to. Um, but they look to get in on that, and so they. Um, yeah, they'll they'll help squash the Boxer Rebellion, which was going around and um, killing foreigners that were in Beijing and in other cities. So um, that's that China will try to reverse the the tide of things, but that'll just make things worse. You get more on unequal treaties, and um, China becoming weaker and weaker in in their economics. So everything goes to pretty much agrarian, and there's very little industrialization, which makes them. Um, yeah, they won't industrialize until uh, we get to the communists. And even then, they won't do a great job of that until, oh, Chairman Deng, I think. Deng Xiaoping. No, am I getting mixed up? No, yeah. I think it's Deng Xiaoping. I need to look that up real quick. Uh, we'll bring that up on the Googles here. But I believe it's Deng Xiaoping in the 70s after... Yeah, he starts the open door policy and all that stuff in the in the late seventies after uh, Mao dies. Um, so yeah, we won't see China industrializing or becoming a major threat or anything like that economically until uh, well until really present day. Let's go back to there. Well, we pretty much covered almost everything for the week. Other questions on things. We've been going for about an hour here, so we'll probably wrap things up here soon so that you guys can go back to relaxing on your spring break and stuff like that. But any other any other questions that you guys want to go through on uh, the opium wars or uh, Japan and whatnot? So one question has come up with the essays. Um, essays are being graded here. Um, I'm through all the classes except for seventh hour, and those ones I'm hoping to wrap up by the end of today or early tomorrow. Um, they should have been done by now. I apologize, um, but uh, those are those are wrapping up here shortly. I'm I'm getting through those. Um, sure, World War One. Always good to bring up stuff in the future. There. What do we have a question on with World War? One. <laughs> So the Ottomans wanted to fight in World War One because of their lack of um, lack of power, and they were hoping by joining in with the uh, Central Powers, uh, which were the Prussians or Germans, uh, the Austro-Hungarians and the Bulgarians, and originally it was supposed to be also the Italians, but the Italians said, "No, we're not going to fight for those reasons." On why Austria-Hungary eventually attacked Serbia, but um. Uh, they, they were hoping to be on the winning side and this would be a renewal for their empire um, and bring them back to a, a top tier status because if they got this and they could uh, take out uh, Britain, um, uh, they could take out Britain and push them out of um, 
Egypt, they might be able to push Italy out of Libya and gain some of that old territory they had and get some spoils and get riches from the war. So that was, that was their big thinking, or, or that was what they were thinking on it. Um, unfortunately for them, um, their military sucks. It, uh, the Tanzimat uh, had industrialized some, but not significantly. Uh, they will win at some major battles like Gallipoli, where the British will just throw their soldiers into a meat grinder, essentially, and have them land on shore and just get torn up and torn to pieces, um, which it was just terrible tactics. And you can thank Winston Churchill for that idea, unfortunately, uh, with him. But um, they they just get they get beaten up. Even even so, with that victory, uh, they get worn down. And really, the, the I'm going on to more than probably you're asking for there. The only reason why the war really continues for a long time is because of how strong the Prussians are uh, militarily. So, um, but yeah, that was their hope. They hoped that by joining Prussia, who had the strongest army, they'd be on the winning side of things and and be revitalized as an empire. And instead, they choose the wrong side, and they're part of one of the powers that gets divided up into um, several new kingdoms, um, just like the Prussians will get divided up and the Austro-Hungarians will be. So, yeah, not a good decision on their part. 